We recently did a video on ADHD treatment during pregnancy. So today we figured we would follow that up with a video about ADHD treatment while breastfeeding. I'm Dr. Michelle Haynes. I'm Dr. Krista Lassiter. And we're Medical Mamas. This is your place for evidence-based information about your reproductive mental health. Meaning mental health in relation to reproductive hormone changes like pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, premenstrual disorders, and infertility. Okay, let's get started. Okay. Here we go. So we'll just, you know, I know we prefaced the ADHD treatment and pregnancy video with this, but similarly, ADHD treatment and breastfeeding, there's even less research and data out there. Like, I think there's like four six. studies <laughs> <laughs> and not studies. Like, they're like, here's six babies. Yeah. Or something that we looked at. And so there's just not a lot of data mm -hmm. just to preface. Right. Right. Which I think, I mean, we could have a whole video on why that is the case. We should do a video on why that's the case. Yeah, day. we should. I mean, I don't have all day. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So basically maybe some like sort of general information about treating ADHD while breastfeeding is that they are not they don't have to be separate, right? You can take a stimulant during breastfeeding. We would want to look at how severe is your ADHD? Are there safety issues related to your ADHD, like leaving the stove on or forgetting to buckle your kids in the car? Or, you know, there's a lot of things that could happen. Forgetting your kid is in the car. Oh, that could be really, especially here where yeah. it's so hot. It's yeah. hot during the summer and that can be a huge safety issue. Yeah. Or if you're using a stimulant for narcolepsy and it's mm -hmm. not safe mm -hmm. for you, you know, to be sleepy during the day. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's indications for using stimulants. And I, especially with my patients, I will talk to them a lot about kind of what we look at with their illness, their specific illness, and how the stimulant is helpful. And we don't only need to be taking the stimulant when we're at a job making money, mm -hmm. right? That there are other times that could be really helpful. And when you're starting back at work after having a baby, it's very common for a lot of women, even if they don't have ADHD, to feel like they're very forgetful, they're more spacey, it's really hard to focus. And so in somebody who does have ADHD, that can be even more enhanced. And it's not wrong to take a stimulant if you need it for your work in order to function at your totally. job, right? Like that's important too. Exactly. So maybe, you know, another general principle is that oftentimes we'll use an extended release version of a medication because inherent ADHD, we have this issue with remembering to do things and task completion. So often people who need stimulants prefer the extended release version because that means they get the second dose throughout the day. They only have to take it one time. You don't have to remember to take, yeah, remember to take the second dose. But with breastfeeding, we might go back to using the immediate release formulation of a medication because then we can really cater to what they need. Maybe they don't need that second dose some days. Maybe we can reduce risk by a reduction in the amount of medication that they're taking. Yeah, so it doesn't last as long in their system and therefore it's not in their breast milk as long. And similarly with baby, once it gets in the baby system, it's not lasting in baby as long either when mm -hmm. we're using the immediate release. Right. Also the immediate release, those can be broken up or changed in terms of the dosage, whereas extended release tablets usually can't be broken because they are designed so that they're digested, digested at different times. So that's also nice because then somebody can kind of change the dose that they might be using day to day because maybe it's a day where they don't need it to last as long or they don't need as high of a dose versus a day when they do. And so those kind of things can be adjusted so then baby's not exposed to more medication than is necessary. So along those same lines, we would use the lowest effective dose. So we're going to try to really titrate here and be really careful about we use what we need and no more than that. So in regards to the infant too, you want to look at their age. Mm -hmm. You want to look at 
if they're only breastfeeding. So mm -hmm. that can be part of the factor. Like if an infant's also formula feeding, like there's even less of a worry mm -hmm. than if they are solely breastfeeding or depending on how old they are, maybe they are now eating solids or other foods. And then also looking at their other medical conditions. So in rare cases of like some cardiac illnesses with infants, you might not want to use stimulants, but that would be something to talk with your pediatrician about. I also think I want to come back to something that you mentioned about breastfeeding or formula feeding, that if you're pumping, one of the things, if I have a patient who's like really worried about like, oh, what would they going to get the stimulant, then I might have them mark the milk. That's the amount of time that the stimulant sort of lasts in your system uh, and mark it and then utilize that in small amounts, right? So like this may not be evidence-based, but... <laughs> It makes sense to me that like if they have milk that has to stimulate in it, maybe they're getting it out of the freezer and they'll put one ounce and then three ounces of milk that doesn't have, right? So then we're even reducing the amount that they're exposed to and they're still able to use that milk, right? So it's like now we're using even less at each time. The concentration's going down. Right, right. So I think there are ways to make it even more comfortable for people who may not be comfortable with the amount that's excreted in the mm -hmm. breast milk. Yeah. Right. Maybe we could talk about that. Yeah. So there's two different classes. Mm -hmm. And so there's methylphenidate and amphetamine. And I will also preface this part mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. there have been no adverse events reported in either class of medications in terms of the infants. So in the very little data that we have, there didn't seem to be any issues with those medications when they were used in breastfeeding. Long term. Long term. Okay. Right. right. For methylphenidates, I know there wasn't any yeah, yeah. like short term right. stuff. Right. Right. For methylphenidates, they studied up to 80 milligrams in a mother. So, a mother who was taking 80 milligrams, they looked at the relative infant dose and how the infant did with that. Mm -hmm. And in the dosage ranges that they've looked at, the relative infant dose stay, has stayed below 1%. Granted, that's only in like six babies that <laughs> they looked at. So it's a very right. small amount. One thing with methylphenidate that theoretically might happen is in people who are taking larger doses, it might decrease their breast milk supply, especially in women who are just starting out with breastfeeding, who don't have a really well-established supply yet. So it's something to kind of be aware of. I think that's more theoretical than actually shown in data, mm -hmm. right? Because even with the amphetamine class of medications, they looked at giving amphetamines to someone who's breastfeeding and looked at their prolactin level, which is the hormone that helps pros for and black to lactation. So prolactin is a hormone that helps you, you know, have and excrete breast milk. And the prolactin levels go down, but there's no comment in those studies about if the actual amount of milk production changed at mm -hmm. all. So we have some data, but what does that data actually like kind of correlate to mm -hmm. in real life? So relative infant dose for methylphenidate is like less than 1%, which is really, really, really reassuring for us. Mm -hmm. For the amphetamine class, the relative infant dose can range from about 2 to 7%. I saw some studies that showed up to 15% in certain circumstances. But again, we have like six bumps. Yeah. Right? Like it's, it's not enough information. I think with the information that we do have, we would generally prefer the methylphenidate class just because of the like the sheer numbers. Mm -hmm. And with the amphetamine class that there is a study, it's like 13 babies. And I think one of them ex like was a little bit more tired than other babies. And there was a little, there was a little bit with them being uh, irritable or colicky mm -hmm. in like three of the babies. I don't know if that's maybe like a little bit of a bias because babies are sort of colicky anyway. Does that tease out with the number of babies who are going to be colicky? Like the, you know, just regular occurrence of colic generally anyway. Mm -hmm. So we don't have that information. Just as an aside, I'm not sick. I'm not doing this video and getting you sick. This is like <laughs> Texas allergies. Can you see it? I'm just like, oh, so Central miserable. Texas. Oh, so miserable. And I'm like on all the medicines and I'm just like, so I'm not here getting other people sick. I'm just, my body just not like whatever is in there. 
All right. So that's, I mean, that's all the information. <laughs> okay, moving on. That's pretty much all the information, unfortunately, that we have on breastfeeding with stimulants. So again, just to recap, it's not impossible to do. You really need to consider how necessary is the medication. You need to consider baby and their growth and development and which medication you're using. And mm-hmm. and yeah, just using as little as possible. Yeah. I think it's ideal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you for being here. Please like, comment, subscribe. We'll see you soon. Bye.